we, as we come into Easter this week, I, I want to take you to just a short uh, part of a verse in Ephesians 3, chapter 18, uh, about where our mindset should be moving towards as we think about the crucifixion of Jesus, about his, his death, about the resurrection, about his ascension. And this is my hope for you this week. May you have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of this week. It's anchored in the goodness of God. It's anchored in his love, his steadfastness. But as, but as we live in the world, we find ourselves in, we of all people <laughs> should be thinking about the grand narrative of the work of Jesus Christ this week. And we land on Palm Sunday, gearing up for this Easter week, this, this triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem it was anticipated that this was going to happen at some point. So the triumphal entry was supposed to be just that, a dethroning of the Roman Empire, a, de a dethroning of any uh, political party, any, any movement that would be against God's people. It was supposed to be eradicated by the Messiah, Hence the excitement, the palm branches, the cloaks upon the gravel leading up to the gates of Jerusalem. Uh, it's not going to be on your screen, but I want to give you a vision of what today represents. And it comes out of Matthew 21, 1 through 11. And now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of, his, two of his disciples out saying, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples then did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks and he, Jesus, sat on them. Most of the crowd took off their cloaks and put them on the road, cut off branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And here is what they were singing, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the city gates, the whole city was stirred up. Yeah, this is chaotic. Who is this? Who is this? And the crowd said, well, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. That's the scene. Palm Sunday. Crazy, loud, just amazing worship leading up to a proclamation through the gates of Jerusalem that the king has arrived. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 118. Like I mentioned earlier, it often would have been sung a few days later before Jesus' arrest. After a meal with his disciples, they would have sung a multitude of psalms indicating that, yes, we have been delivered from Egypt, but we are longing for this king to come, our Messiah, Jesus gets into the city and he gets into an argument with the Pharisees. And Jesus tells them, 
All right, and, th- and those that were asking, well, who is this Jesus? There was a huge collective crowd saying, well, he's the king. And then there was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, that as Jesus entered on a cult, expectations weren't met. There was no deliverance. That there was no army physically. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing. And I like how it ends with a question. And it is marvelous in our eyes? As Jesus looked upon Jerusalem, as he was coming into the city itself, the text tells us that he wept. Jesus full well knew from the dawn of time that he would take on flesh, carry the burdens of sin, and be crucified upon the cross. I'm convinced that's not why he's weeping. He's weeping because the very people that should have called him king, the very people that were singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest would be the same people saying, crucify him. Release Barabbas. We'll take anybody put this king on his cross. The cornerstone was rejected. The psalmist in 118 is most like to be King David, who had his own trials, who was on the run for his own life, but knew that there was to be a cornerstone, something outside of himself that would ultimately present a plan of salvation to his people. John Calvin, uh, looking at our Psalm 118, says this about the psalm in his own life. This psalm I love. For it has often served me well and it has helped me out of grave troubles when neither emperor, kings, wise men, clever men, nor saints could have helped me. Think about how lonely it would have been for Jesus to walk through the city gates rejected. With the worship service outside of the city gates, it was so short-lived. It was so short-lived. They didn't usher him to the throne. <laughs> no. As he entered, there were questions, there were arguments, there were conflicts. And yet, in Psalm 118, verse 26, it says this, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless from the house of the Lord. You go from Hosanna to the highest, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to crucify him. Put thrones upon his head, pierce his side. I want to focus on the triumphal element of this first text. And then where our psalm this morning, Psalm 118, kind of collides with it, and there, and there are four significant things that we need to understand and take heart when thinking about Palm Sunday. Um, this week was a hard week for my, for me being being a dad. I had to sit my kids down and talk to them about why their school was closed on Friday. Christian schools and charter schools from Fort Collins to Loveland. And, and we didn't necessarily get into the nitty-gritty details of what happened in Nashville, but there was a conversation about how in the world we live in Genesis 3, not because of anything new, <laughs> because of the heart, there is a growing angst, because of depravity, a growing angst against the Creator God. And there is a movement towards and new religions forming, they're forming as we speak, about how humans can become gods, <laughs> literally. This is nothing new. It happened in the golden age. It happened before the creation of Eden. This has been going on and has been the play since the fallen ones. Remember that in Genesis 6? 
Do you remember what God gave them? They gave them authority in the earth and it went sour. Do you remember the Tower of Babel narrative? The Tower of Babel was a, it was a try, a false try, a broken try, a ziggurat to try to be God. That's what it was. They didn't want to obey, and so in their humanness, they decided we will craft something and figure it out on our own. And I had to talk to my kids about, hey, this is what happens when hearts are turned. This is what happens when the dragon, the evil one, comes in and manipulates who you were created to be. And you think about Palm Sunday, the praising, the rejoicing, and then multiple days later, they want to crucify him. How fickle the human heart is. It's a danger. And that's why when I, when I look at this psalm, when I look at Psalm 118, and there is great distress in this because of what David is going through. There is great rejoice. He doesn't abandon his faith. He does not look to himself and his humanity to redeem himself. Verse 25 says this. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. This is the connecting piece to this idea of Palm Sunday. That's why they were singing Hosanna. Salvation was finally coming. It was, it was here. Save us. Not, we can't save ourselves. Save us. Salvation is at the doorstep. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The church and I should be united around how Christ has saved us. We are to worship the one who God has given. If, if you read your Bibles, really, from the creation of man to the end of Revelation, it is a battle over who gets to be God. Turing that again. You hear, you, hear, you hear language of transhumanism. You hear these things talked about how spirituality is at the fastest growing rate. It's 100 years. Why is that? The human heart naturally rebels against the idea that we are to worship the one who God has given. But with that, we're, we, we are to anticipate with great joy that salvation is possible a recognition that we cannot ourselves, and that success is not attached to our own efforts but the gift and deliverance that God has provided there's a great personal narrative in Psalm 118 about uh, if you believe that David wrote this psalm it would be directly about him starting in verse 10 it says this with I seek you <laughs> Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. That was chapter 119, which was really good, but it wasn't 118. <laughs> Potentially written by the same man. <laughs> Interesting, because you go back to his travesties listed in verse 10 of 118. All the nations surround me, right? In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I like this. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Hmm. The Lord is my strength. And my song, he has become my salvation. Uh, you might not be on the run for your physical life, but, but as I sat down with my kids on the couch in the living room and I'm talking, I'm having to talk to them about these intricacies in the world we live in, conversations that my parents didn't have to have with me, about tensions, about relationships with friends, about the potential of them being ridiculed for their faith. Not just ridiculed, but a growing sense of anger and angst. And it's not to my daughter, it's not to my son, but the and angst is to the Savior that God has provided. 
There's real pain, there's real brokenness, there's fractures all around. What we're seeing is nothing new. It is deception that you were made to be your own savior. So when people were singing Hosanna and when they were putting palm branches down, I believe they did it in good faith. But their expectations were shattered. It didn't take long for them to reorient their expectations to this, could, this is the king of the Jews. This is the Messiah to being convinced because there wasn't a takeover of Jerusalem and the Roman Empire, convinced to sing, nail him to the cross. Be done with this guy. And it started in the garden, Genesis 3. The manipulation, the coercion, the convincing that God and his plan isn't adequate It's not good enough. Did God actually say, you shall not eat? Is is the plan good enough? You will not surely die. For, For God knows that when you take of the fruit and eat it, you will be like him. In some texts, in the ancient Hebrew text, it was you will be like the gods, plural. You will know things that you deserve to know. So then when Eve and Adam standing there, when they both thought the tree was good for the things that the serpent had promised, they took of it. And what did it bring? Corruption. Corruption. Guilt and, and, and shame. And what happens to people when they are pushed to the of themselves? When they come to a place where they disagree with the plan of salvation that God has provided, and when they start shouting, nail him to the cross. When they're pushed to the ends of themselves because the plan that they have to save themselves, to justify themselves, doesn't work out. They crack. It happens. You will get in the world we live in Christ or chaos. You will. And this is my heart because it impacts me and my family this week greatly. And it threw my whole plan of of preaching through a different text to this reality that when we think about Palm Sunday, there is a danger in it, a grave danger. A danger in rejecting Jesus himself. And it looks different than it, than it did then with God's people. We too are faced with the same cornerstone. Who builds our life? Who determines who we are? Where does our identity come from? How do we save ourselves? That cornerstone can be rejected as much as it was then. In our own hearts. So as God's people, we are constantly to be remembering God's plan and design for salvation. And this leads to a third point in verses 27 through 28 of Psalm 118. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the feastal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. We are to desire the saving life of Christ and not just the benefits of him. So I think that happened in this Palm Sunday scenario where so much of the salvation that God's people thought was a political deliverance. Take down the Roman Empire. And all of the worship was surrounding that maybe this Messiah would do just that in this time, that he would come and deliver his people physically, politically, through force. And here Jesus rides into the gates as the righteous one on a donkey. 
unmet expectations. We are to desire the saving life of Christ and not just the benefits. So as joyous of an occasion this Sunday represents for God's people, there's a danger on Palm Sunday and it was anchored in desire. When you think about the arrival of Jesus as the Messiah on your behalf, do you love the fact that he's just arrived or do you love him? Do do you like the idea of, of, hey, I love the fact that now God has provided me, a Gentile, with an opportunity not to go to hell, but I can go to heaven. That's a great exchange there. Part of the desperation of Jesus riding a colt into Jerusalem is the fact that he knew that the very people he loved and ministered to would reject him. Do you love him over the benefits of him? I can't stress this enough. You you and I need to learn to love and know our king and his world more than we ever have. There is going to come a time, and I believe soon, in the next five to ten years, where you will be faced to say, Christ is Lord or abandon your faith. Churches will be faced. I, I'm, I'm as, as serious as I can speak about this. Churches will be faced. They will be sued. They will be brought to court, and you will have to stand and say, I believe in the name of Jesus. And it is a slow march through the institutions that has brought us to this place. Not out of fear that we live, but my encouragement to you is you and I need to double down on what we believe and why. And it's not anchored in in just this category of theology and doctrine, which is so important. It's anchored in savoring Jesus. Because when you're standing before the magistrate as a pastor and you have to say, I stand on the word of God and God alone. It doesn't come out of an intellectual, passionate exercise. No, it comes out of remembering what Jesus has done for you and you stand being nailed to the cross with Jesus in confidence. And whatever happens to your church, whatever happens to you is irrelevant. You stand with Jesus. And so you can imagine when when Jesus was about to uh, essentially be traded for Barabbas, there were, I believe, there were Jews in that crowd that felt sick to their stomach as their friends and their relatives shouted, crucify him. (laughs) They knew. And as Jesus was hanging upon that tree, you remember the guard statement? Surely. This was the Son of God. Surely, there was a cornerstone that was rejected. My advice to you is prepare, double down, be encouraged, be a part of this fellowship wherever you find yourself in a church world, but be prepared not to reject the cornerstone. Because Jesus says in Matthew 23, 39, He says this about the future. For I tell you, you will not see me again until I say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we are to be thankful and exalt him. Whatever happens, whatever may pass in our lives, thank him for his salvation And so when we as Christians are plopped into this world, if you're a 12-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 23-year-old, and you're plopped into this world and you're thinking, how do I remain faithful to walk accordingly to the words of God? It starts with this, understanding that you were born into a broken world in your own depravity. It's got to start there. Because when we get to the good news of God's salvation... We need to take that good news and it needs to be spread like fertilizer on dying grass. It needs to be spread out so new life can form. And when that happens, thanksgiving is not grounded in what you have done for yourself, but what he has done for you. 
The result is choosing to worship him with our lives. Next Sunday, we celebrate, we celebrate this idea of an empty tomb. And, and, a, and, a, and a question arises, well, what does that mean for you? What does it mean for me? Is he your cornerstone? Do you trust him? Do you worship him as Lord and Savior? Like I mentioned, the, the, the danger on the original Palm Sunday for those that waved the palm branches and placed their cloaks upon the ground is no different of a danger today in our own hearts, in the world we live in. It's a tension of who gets to be God. That is the battle we are in. Yes, it's a battle over the dictionary who defines terms, it, but, but ultimately it's a battle over who gets to play God. Nothing new. It happened then, it, it happens now, it will happen in future human hearts. Because oftentimes we desire a king on our own terms, and when the king doesn't give us what we thought we should have, we deconstruct. You hear that word all around Christianity these days. Deconstructionism. I did not get what I thought I was going to get. The unraveling of a foundation that was built on sand. I don't want to be one of the voices among the scoffers. Remember the scoffers when Jesus took the cross upon his shoulders and he walked his road to Golgotha. They spit at him. They cursed him. They made fun of him. This week, this Easter week, is a great reminder to believe in a Savior. Revisit, if you are his, why you needed him in the first place. Our big danger this morning is this. Because of the temptation of the world we live in, because of your own heart at times and the circumstances you find yourself in, resist the temptation to cancel Christ when you don't get what you want. <laughs> but rather, submit yourself to trust in his plan as you get to know him more. Resist the temptation to put your, what you think should happen in the, in, the, in the forefront of your mind. Resist the temptation to elevate your emotions to a place of, this is the ultimate God that I should be worshiping. How I feel, resist that so you don't become like the scoffers. But rather submit yourself to trust in his plan of deliverance for you as you get to know him more. This is exactly what the disciples would have to do this next week as they witness their friend, their savior, their teacher, their Messiah nailed to a cross. On this Palm Sunday, let us not be people who praise the coming king one second and abandon him the next. May we pray that God would open our eyes and hearts so we can find hope in the promise that God's steadfast love has come to his people. Let us wave our palm branches and shout words of praise to Jesus as he enters the gates of righteousness because today, as the text said, is a day that the Lord has made. And what does it say? We shall be glad. We shall be glad in it. We shall rejoice and be glad as we join all the saints of God in proclaiming, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord, the one who provided the plan for salvation. That's my charge for you this week, it's not a charge to be fearful, it's a charge to rejoice, but it's also a charge to understand our heart's tendency to wander. We're prone to it. 
And it's, not, it's nothing new. It's, it's not a new creation or a new thing we just discovered in, in the human heart. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years. So when we sing Hosanna in the highest, when, when you remember that space, when you came to Christ as a broken individual, you now are tasked with getting to know that very Savior outside of just the benefits he's provided for you. Get to know his personhood. Get to know his word. Get to, get to know the promises he gives you, things that are coming that have not come yet. And at Rocky Mountain Church, we're going to be adamant about teaching on those things to give you confidence to live in a world that adamantly hates Jesus. They hate him. Because his proposition is you need to die. You need to die. And until we surrender to that reality, the effort, the trying, the justification will lead to more anger, more division, more angst, because the human heart was not designed to save itself. And so as you turn on the news, as you have conversations with your kids, you have to understand the world we live in. We don't want to freak out. We're not going to become weird, militant people. We're going to rest in the promises of Jesus, but we're going to live in reality. And we're going to stand fast. Amen? All right, let's pray. Oh, Father. Uh, we live in a world that uh, you created. It's your world. You are sovereign over it. But things happen. There is evil that is allowed to reside there are human hearts that are wicked. And we identify with that. All of our human hearts were wicked. All of our human hearts cannot be trusted on their own. And so we need a Savior. You sent your Son, and we celebrate that. This week as we think about the coming Messiah, the only one who was righteous to enter the gates of Jerusalem, to walk through the interrogations, the argumentations, the blaspheming, the ridicule, the rejection of friends. And he knew what he was doing the whole time, riding upon a donkey to eventually be placed upon a cross. But we know the story doesn't end there. And so we rejoice at the same time. May this week strengthen our faith. May it give us a resurgence and a passion for knowing you. In your name, amen. Thank you.